Hi, quarantine people. How you guys doing? Here's your lesson on chapter 10, Information Technology Impact on Healthcare. We are going to look and define health information technology, health information systems, and health or medical informatics. We can look at the pros and cons of electronic health records and evaluate the impact of information technology on healthcare stakeholders. And um, the rest of the lesson is going to be assigned to you as homework. All right, so did you know e-prescribing is a form of clinical decision support systems, which we're going to look at. The average cost to install an electronic health record software system in a physician's office is $55,000. Not cheap. The Food and Drug Administration has approved a medical robot that can make rounds checking on patients in different rooms. And the Microsoft HealthBot, Microsoft's version of an electronic patient record, now has a feature that allows patients to pre-register for hospital procedures and admissions. All oh, that's really interesting. All right, so let's start. The general term of informatics refers to the science of computer application to data in different industries. Health or medical informatics is the science of computer application that supports clinical and research data in different areas of healthcare. The health information systems are systems that store, transmit, collect, and retrieve these data. All right, so just getting the definitions out of the way here. So the goal of health information technology is to manage health data that can be used by patients, which are consumers, um, insurance companies, healthcare providers, healthcare administrators, and any stakeholder that has an interest in healthcare. So anybody that would need the information in order to help care for the patient or bill or anything like that. Uh, continued increases in healthcare costs and the lack of access to quality healthcare, resulting in a need to develop more efficient healthcare delivery, has led to an increased use of technology. So we're hoping that, you know, the the idea, even though it's an investment up front, it takes a little time, some training. There's there's this investment in money and time up front. In the long run, it does lead to more efficient um, healthcare delivery. All right, first question for you in your Neopod. So write me an example of health data. What is health data? All right, the result of this move into you know, being more efficient into health informatics is what we call the population health movement. So the CDC views population health as an interdisciplinary method that provides resources to address designated health disparities in populations. So. With population health efforts, partnerships that include public health, industries, academia, and local and state health departments focus on creating solutions to improve population health outcomes. So with the idea here is with all this data that we're gathering and that's coming into systems and all that, you can, you can finally really analyze and get some really good big picture of what is going on in the population, where there might be holes, which should be those health disparities, are they in certain geographical locations? Are they in certain populations, as in, you know, th via different ethnicities, or, or what? Like, where's where? What's going on here? Um, so, population health management, which was abbreviated PBM, I imagine population-based management, maybe, has the goal to keep a population healthy, minimizing expensive care such as hospitalization and expensive tests. Um, and it's based on a PBM movement. So again, um, looking at the data that we, that we have already to, to better manage, for example, let's say a diabetic population. Um, if, you, if you're looking at the population in an area of, or, or all the patients in a clinic that have diabetes or something like that, then you can use that to see how well are they managed what is, you know, are they getting the A1Cs, are they getting their checkups, or, so, or are they being hospitalized a lot? Um, so that would be, for example, just one type of population to manage. The AHRQ, so the Agency on Healthcare Research and Quality, has created a practice-based population health, um, which is primary care practices is targeted population data and it used to improve a population's health outcomes. So they're using the data from the the practices from the physician's offices and stuff. Uh, another example would be to see how many people have gotten their immunizations uh, through the physician's office or, or what. Uh, health informatics plays a, a role in both the PBM and uh, the practice-based population health because of the continual need for 
evidence-based decision making in healthcare. So we need to look at data and use data to drive the decisions. But then, like, if you if you think the solution to a problem is X, and you base it on some data that you've collected. And then you implement the solution and then you track the data afterwards. If that was the correct solution, there should be an improvement in the outcomes in the data that you collect that should be reflected in the numbers and stuff. If that wasn't the correct solution for the problem, then likely you won't see uh, numbers change. And this is again at the population level. So lots and lots and lots of people. This is not just a one individual patient. So um, using an, an electronic health record system coupled with, for example, a messaging system that can contact patients who need to be seen can attribute to the su success of these practice-based population health. So for example, um, if we were talking about immunizations, then there could be a system where all the patients in that practice um, that have not gotten their flu shot or whatever, they will get reminders, hey, don't forget to get your flu shot, for example. The establishment of a Chief Information Officer or CIO in healthcare organizations emphasize how important information systems are and uh, technology have become to healthcare organizations. The U.S. healthcare system has been the world leader for developing all these cutting edge technology in healthcare and we're usually ahead of other people in that. Even though we don't have universal healthcare, we have a lot of cool technology. In 2001, the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, published a report that is called Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system for the 21st century that stressed the importance of improving the information technology infrastructure. Um, and so this is 2001. This is, I don't know, about 10 years after the internet really got going and got popular. Not quite 10 years, but pretty close. And um, you know, there, still there was a, a lack of use of the computers or um, they were just islands of computers and they weren't connected and talking to each other and sharing uh, information. It emphasized the importance of an electronic health record, uh, which is an electronic record of the patient's mil medical history. Um, one of the importance of an electronic health record, and we're going to look at that, is that it's, it's the health record of the patient across all of these different systems. Uh, it also discusses the importance of patient safety by establishing, of course, data standards for collecting patient information. All right, so this here um, video I will um, also link, but um, just watch it in the Nearpod, talks about <clears throat> why electronic health records are important. This is a video about Canada, but the idea applies just the same. According to the um, Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, or the HITECH Act, uh, which was enacted as part of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, was designed to stimulate the adoption of health information technology in the U.S. So uh, it got it put some incentives and some penalties and all that to try to help push um, again all of these practices and hospitals and all that to go to uh, start using health information and uh, technology. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology is responsible for implementing the incentives and penalty, penalties programs. So they created a min, meaningful use guidelines for the physicians and others that will help them receive the incentive payments and avoid the penalties. So part of the High Tech Act was the implementation and help for it to implement this, uh, these electronic health record systems, but um, you, they couldn't be just paperweights, just sitting there. Okay, they're implemented, they're there, and we're not using them, or they're not being adequately used. So they had to just put guidelines of what meaningful use meant, and so that the, the you know, the different companies and hospitals and physicians and offices and all that could meet those guidelines, so that they could get their payments and avoid their penalties. Nearly all states are administering the program. The federal government pays 90% of the state's costs for implementing this type of electronic system. State has to come up with the other 10%. And as of 2017, 86% of office-based physicians had adopted an EHR system. That's still not 100% in 2017. You would think it would be 200%, but it's not. And over 95% of the hospitals eligible for Medicare and Medicaid um, have achieved min meaningful use. So what's meaningful use? Uh, meaningful use, as defined by the CMS, so uh, Medicare and Medica Medicare Services, has established core measures that healthcare providers have to meet 
um, to determine the EHR system as being adequately used. For example, providers have to have entered one medication using the CPOE, such as this computer physician order entry system, for at least 30% of their patients. So it would be simply this, if you're a physician's office and you're coming in and they want to write you a prescription for something, it could be a refill for a medication that you're on. It could be maybe you come in for something and you need some cough medicine or something like that. Then if they send that, put it in the system and send it electronically straight to your pharmacy, that would be an example of meaningful use and they do for doing that for at least 30% of their patients. Um, I'm sure other things would be um, you know, scheduling visits, scheduling reminders and stuff, sending email blast or message blast. Um, you know, uh, for reminders to patients to come in for their checkups or for their flu shot or something like that. Okay, so poll question, which of these is, is an example of a meaningful use of an electronic health record? So e-prescribing, sending a text or email reminder about an upcoming appointment, sharing patient health records with specialists, or all of these. Okay, so this video um, is a really good way um, video that explains the difference between an electronic health record and an electronic medical record, not the same thing. So the National Alliance for Health Information and Technology, the NAHIT, defines an electronic medical record or an EMR as the electronic record of health-related information on an individual that is accumulated from one health system and is utilized by the health organization that is providing patient care. Whereas the electronic health record accumulates one patient, more patient medical information from many health organizations that have been involved in the patient care and that can be shared with other sites. So to, to see the distinction, if you, for example, we can use the two hospital systems in our area. So we have St. Bernard Hospital System and we have any Baptist Hospital System. Well, um, each hospital system, if you if you went to for a visit to one or to the other, then um, each hospital system then uh, has an EMR on you. And the thing with those is, um, if it's an EMR, it just it's just in that hospital. So if you if you had a visit, for example, at one and you come back later, uh, maybe you had a procedure, now you're in their ER and all that, they can. Uh, pick up everything from where you've been at their facility but if in in the meantime you were at the other facility so at uh, if you you know if you know a seminar and you had a visit at any Baptist maybe you went to see a specialist there or something like that and um, they, the, your, the record of your visit would be in their system and the people at St. Bernard's won't be able to see it unless they request that the information is sent over because they each have their own EMR uh, that's at their location. So that's the big idea. Whereas an electronic health record would network all of the hospitals with the pharmacist, with the physician's offices and everything and then all your data from all the hospital visits, from all your prescriptions, from all your doctor's visits, from all your specialist visits, from all the tests that you've had and everything, even from reference labs and stuff like that, would all be in one location. That would be an electronic health record. Okay, so answer these questions. So for each one of these, I want you to select if it's an EMR or EHR. So uh, the record of all your prescriptions at your pharmacy, uh, the e-chart record, uh, of you, your signs and symptoms, sorry, on your last visit to urgent care, your latest lab results in the MyQuest or IEL or, or LabCorp app, your MyChart app, which has your lab test results, MRI results, future appointments, immunization records, and the messages from your primary care provider. And that is it. So answer all of those. And then what would be the benefits of electronic health record versus the old paper, paper records to answer that question? Okay, so a little bit on the benefits of electronic health record. Um, it increased the comprehensive reporting that integrates both the clinical and the administrative data. So it's all together, all the physician's notes, the nurse's notes, but the administrative data like with the billing and um, you know, filing to the, the health insurance and stuff like that. 
your demographics, where you live, driver's license number, all of that kind of stuff. It provides an opportunity to analyze and review patient outcomes because of the standardization of clinical assessments. So um, a lot of times you know, with a computer system, you have either like data to fill in, like blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. But then um, there are things that you can select on um, assessment of alertness, for example. There are standardized choices which makes that good because um, you know each person that's assessed is using the same words because they're having to select from a list versus if they were handwriting they you know one might select one word or, or quantify it a certain way while while another quantifies it differently okay so that is really important uh, and then because it's standardized all of a sudden now it can be analyzed also the development of electronic automated reports that improve patient discharge. So um, if you've been hospitalized, it should be able to print your, your discharge, like this is what you admitted for, this is what we did, this is what we prescribed, this is um, what you need to do for follow-up, and all of that, and all of that is in one patient record, which is really good. And improve operational efficiency. So you have, if you need to look up something, it's right there in the computer system. You don't have to be digging through a chart, you know, hoping that you find it or, you know, maybe a report is missing or something like that. No, it's there. It's in the computer record. Um, the computerized documentation takes 30% less time than handwriting notes. Um, plus it's legible. <laughs> you can actually read it. Physicians writing is uh, notoriously really bad. And also provides aggregate data and the patient records to other departments. So aggregate data is data over time or data you know, put together. So one of the cool things, for example, in the lab systems is if you have a patient that's coming in for some lab work and they've been there before from some previous lab work, maybe there's something they're, they're monitoring or tracking or something like that, where you can see aggregate data so you can see their previous results from the same tests that they're doing over time. So let's say they're tracking their thyroid hormones or something like that over time, then you can see with each, you know, visit every six months, how their thyroid levels and things are changing over time. All right, this is another good video about um, the integration of an electronic health record uh, system and how it improved um, the workflow in the hospital. Some of the issues with electronic health records are uh, it's costly to implement. Um, and then data standards that can be used nationally, if you think about it, um, programs use specific coding languages. And so the coding language, for example, for the machines that run all the lab tests and for the lab information system that connects all the different machines in the lab that run the, the lab test also has to communicate with the charts on the nursing end and has to be able to get information coming in from the ordering system and the patient registration system and all of that. And all of these data, they have to be able to understand each other. And so there has to be standards there to to how to code stuff, what things mean and all of that, so that these systems can talk to each other and send data back and forth and, and be used efficiently. Um, you have to have adequate training for uh, both healthcare professionals and staff to uh, fully utilize the system. So if you get a new system, even physicians have to be trained on how to use a new system. Uh, you know, nurses, everybody have to go through training so you know where to find stuff, you know how to enter stuff, what to do, what not to do, and all of that. Um, and the some of the EHR issues is we need a uniform adoption of the EHR system by all participants. Some participants are still opting to not do it. We, didn't, we don't have 100% implementation, which means there's always going to be uh, things that are out of the, out of the loop uh, for those that are not participating. Um, this one is really interesting, this video I want you to watch um, about mistakes that can happen and this is one of the issues with electronic health records. So some of the initiatives in October 2008, Microsoft developed the Health Vault we website that enables patients to develop an electronic patient record free of charge. And these electronic health records are the patient component of this electronic health record. So it's it's their end of it. Um, and so, and it can tie into, of course, the, the other health records, you know, all of it can tie together. 
Artificial intelligence, uh, so clinical decision support systems, or CDSS. So artificial intelligence is a field of computerized methods and technologies created to imitate human decision making. So it's a computer that's trying to think like a human. The technique of AI is expert systems. And these are developed to imitate experts' knowledge and decision making. Uh, experts can be physicians, cardiologists and specialists, but it, experts can also be lab techs, radiology techs, um, nurses, and different things like that. So um, using the way they think about stuff, um, they develop these AI expert systems that then can um, assist the user in making the correct decisions given the data that's coming in on the patient. So clinical decision support systems are systems that are designed to integrate medical information, patient information, and a decision-making tool to generate information to assist with cases. So this decision support system is looking and saying, you have this patient with these symptoms, and this is, these are his vital signs, and they're on this medication, or they have these lab results and all that. Should you not consider adding this medication? Should you not consider this diagnosis? Maybe you need this other test or something like that. So expert system can be used to alert and remind healthcare providers of a change in a patient's condition or to have a lab test or an intervention performed. So maybe it reminds them, hey, it's been 24 hours, you need to check, um, we need to order another CBC on this patient. Or it can uh, tell them, hey, um, it is time for um, the patient's next breathing treatment or something like that. Or they can tell you, hey, uh, this patient's heart rate is way up. It's way beyond what it normally is for this patient. Uh, it can also assist with a diagnosing, a diagnosis, sorry, using the systems database. So uh, it can look at, again, signs and symptoms, presentations, vital signs, lab results, and all that kind of stuff, pull it all together, and suggest different diagnoses. Um, the, an expert system can expose weaknesses in a treatment plan or can check for drug interactions and allergies. Uh, and this can be um, especially helpful when you have so many hands in the pot, so many people, you know, you've got PT, you've got OT, you've got the nurses, you've got the physicians, you've got procedures, you've got lab tests and all that kind of stuff. And maybe something is not being done or maybe overlook, maybe you overlook social work or something like that. So it can point out, hey, this is still missing this patient's record or we have not ordered any of this, what's going on. Uh, and then the drug interaction and allergies is important because um, it's sometimes when you have a complicated case, it might be several physicians involved and they might be prescribed different medications, not knowing or not being fully aware of everything that the patient's taking. It can interpret imaging tests to flag any abnormalities. This is uh, increasing use, um, for example, for mammograms. Now you can pay a little extra and it will run it through this computerized program that can pick up on things that the physician, uh, you know, the human eye might potentially miss, um, which makes it a lot more thorough and a lot more likely to solve also to flag minor things that are actually not relevant. Um, more complex duty of the system requires that it integrates with the EHR system so um, it can interface with the, with the patient data. So that's, that's especially with the medical imaging and the lab stuff, that, that's what sometimes can be a challenge is you have to, the data has to be able to flow back and forth. And with uh, medical imaging, the coding, the images are harder to code. So at the very least in the medical imaging systems, um, you results of a CT or results of an MRI or whatever, the final interpretation should be able to cross over into the EMR, EHR system, even if the images themselves can't um, and they stay behind in the, you know, imaging side of things. A few legal and ethical issues. Um, so as with any technological development, the regulations are often lag behind the implementation. The major legal barrier is the sharing of patient information electronically with other providers because you have to ask, does it violate, violate the HIPAA regulations pertaining to privacy and confidentiality? They're sharing your patient data across all of these different platforms really without your authorization. It's like you have an uh, implied consent when you, when you sign um, sign in and, and start using um, their 
system that you know basically you're allowing them to do this for more efficient care but you really they're not going to ask you can we send this to you know your pharmacy so you can fill your prescription can we send this to your health insurance so we can bill and, and get paid and stuff like that can we send your your information of your hospitalization to your primary care physician they're not going to ask i mean they should part of hipaa says they should but the reality is they don't and so uh, and would you want to have to consent to every piece of information that has to leave uh, in order for your care to flow because then if you had to manually approve it and what if you were sick and or not really with it and uh, it can be it can be a problem there too so uh, again um, computerized order uh, physician order entry so clinical this is part of clinical decisions and support systems so um, this computerized physician order entry system enables a patient's provider to enter a prescription order or an order for a lab test or a diagnostic test, such as an imaging test, into a computer system. Um, the idea here is that the physician knows what lab tests and what imaging tests they want, and is the idea is for the physician to order it. It used to, the physician would scribble all the orders on a piece of paper on the chart, and then the, the secretaries or the nurses and all that had to interpret their writing, uh, understand what they wanted, and then order it. And sometimes mistakes were made um, because of the way the order was written, the way the nurse or the unit secretary interpreted it, and all of that. The order entry has four components, and the information can be entered from either a handheld device, a laptop, or desktop computer. So you have to be able to enter that information select a test select the lab test when you want it done all that kind of stuff it should enable the provider to order a test prescription or procedure at a specific time and all of that and it's connected to a decision support system that alerts providers of any problems with their orders so for example oh this is a duplicate duplicate order um, this can all often happen with panels so um, in lab tests for example um, they are tests that you order, for, for example, basic me basic metabolic panel, you can order, it has multiple tests in it. And uh, if the physician then also ordered, uh, or a different physician came in and ordered something like just a potassium level or something like that, they may show that, hey, this is a duplicate because we already have a BMP order. So again, that, that could show them uh, problems with the orders, or they put in order, but they didn't put in when they want it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it can be integrated into the overall computer system of the organization and, of course, uh, interact with the uh, electronic health record and then interact with the, the pharmacy, with the lab, with uh, medical imaging and all of that. Okay, so which do you think leads to efficient quality care? The physician asks the unit secretary or the nurse to log in and order the test he wants on a patient, or the physician orders the test he or she wants for the patient by logging into the system and selecting the test. So uh, another CPOE specifically e-prescribing. So it focuses on electronic prescription ordering by a provider for their patient. Uh, it also focuses on improving patient safety because um, it seeks to address problems that arise in medication ordering and administration because of drugs with similar sounding names, similar dosages, and similar labeling. So especially if it's handwritten, uh, it might get misinterpreted because the names look and sound alike. So that if the physician is ordering it on their end in an electronic format, then he knows exactly which one it is. and um, Again, it can also verify with e prescription I mean, that that's adequate for the type of patient, et cetera, that the dosage is adequate for that type of drug, so you don't order crazy dosages and all of that. And e prescribing can be performed on a desktop computer, laptop, or handheld device that records a physician's prescription orders and eliminates the need uh, for an individual to read a handwritten prescription. There's another advantage to this and also to linking all the pharmacies and stuff like that is that, um, you know, prescription pads used to, we, we had handwrite it used to uh, be stolen and people would forge prescriptions or they would make copies of them and ha try to have a prescription, especially for something like an opiate filled at multiple locations and stuff like that. And e-prescribing just really puts a hamper on all of that because it goes straight through electronically, there's not a paper record, there's no way to duplicate it and all of that. 
Section 132 of the Medicare Improvement for Patient and Providers Act of 2008 uh, authorized incentives to encourage physicians to e-prescribe. In January 2009, Medicare and some private health care plans began paying a bonus to physicians who e-prescribed their Medicare patients. And since 2012, Medicare has also penalized physicians, physicians who do not e-prescribe by reducing their reimbursement rates by 1%, then 1.5%. And then two percent as the years go by so they really really want this again it helps with uh, preventing fraud and patient safety and efficient care and all of that kind of stuff pharmacy benefit managers um, there are companies that administer drug benefits for employers and health insurance carriers they contract with managed care organizations self-insured employers medicare medicaid managed care plans federal health insurance programs and local government organizations. Um, about 95% of all patients with drug coverage receive benefits through a pharmacy benefit manager. They manage approximately 70% of more than 3 billion prescriptions in the U.S. Uh, these guys are um, why, for example, uh, if especially if you're in managed care and all that, they might, um, if you're on a medication that's like you have to take it every month, a blood pressure medicine or something like that, they will encourage for you to get um, prescription via mail or something like mail in and they'll do like three months at a time and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, they they basically just manage all your pharmaceutical stuff in an effort to reduce drug cost and drug prices and stuff. Um, drug drug interactions are used by software programs to alert pharmacists and clinicians about potential drug drug interactions. Alerts can notify the provider that two drugs may interact or that there may be um, some management strategies provided regarding the, these drug drug interactions. So they may say, hey, he's on this and you're prescribing that and that's going to interact, but if you switched it to this, other medication then it would be safer or something like that so uh, this is really really important because obviously you don't want to cause harm to your patient there are so many medications out there it's really hard to keep straight what like what cannot uh, be taken with what in the different interactions especially if you have um, patients that are what to call like multi pharmacies there are on like lots and lots of different prescription uh, no kidding there are, there are patients that will show up to the ERs and all that with gym bags full of prescription medications and stuff or a big old gallon ziploc bag full of prescription medications and it's like you look at it and you're like you know there's got to be some stuff that's interacting in there Health information exchanges and regional health information organizations. Um, the health information exchanges were developed as a single source platform to collect, store, and share data that can be used by healthcare providers uh, to make informed healthcare decisions. They can collect data from different patient care sources who in turn extract more comprehensive patient information to make more informed clinical care decisions. So again, it can it extracting it from patient visits, from hospital visits, from pharmacy stuff, and just brings it all in together um, and then can suggest different things uh, for the physician uh, regarding the patient. They are the foundation of data-driven patient care because they provide the ability of this interoperability among the patient systems to integrate their data. Again, it allows the pharmacy system, the lab system, the order entry system, the health record, the nurse's notes, the admission stuff, the health insurance stuff, all of that to talk together and to exchange data back and forth. In turn, the regional health information organizations are a group of organizations funded by the federal government within a certain geographic area that share their health data electronically, typically from EHR or EMR systems, and there were often a depository for the health information exchange integrated data. So there you go. So, so regional organization. A little bit about blockchain technology. This is a new one for me. I thought it was interesting. So it is a system for recording and storing transaction records, which are distributed across all the participants who are sending the data. And um, there's an analogy here I'm going to use in just a second to explain that. No transactions occur without the knowledge of the participants. So everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Things are logged. You can audit trail things. And security is extensive. 
It can be used with health information exchanges and regional health information organizations. It could be the platform for a national system for EHR because of its interoperability. According to a recent white paper, health organizations can transmit information to the blockchain. And here's your analogy. A simple analogy for understanding blockchain technology is Google Doc. So when we cre if you create a Google document and share it with a group of people, maybe you're working on a project together with four or five other people, the document is distributed instead of copied or transferred. So you put a Google Doc out there and then five people can work on it at the same time. It's different than, for example, sending a Word document and emailing it to these five people because then they each have their own copy. They each work on stuff, but you don't know what everybody else is, is doing. Whereas in a Google Doc, you know instantly what somebody else has just written or posted or changed the document and all that because all the changes and everything happens uh, in real time and stuff. So another thing that's important is no one is locked out awaiting the changes from another party, which that used to be a problem with uh, EMRs where uh, if, if a nurse or physician was in their health record, then um, the secretary couldn't get in or whatever. You had to wait till, the other, till that person was done and logged out of that patient in order for somebody else to log in and do their thing. Um, and all modifications to the doc are being recorded in real time, making changes completely transparent happen. So that's the idea of blockchain technology. So you take the Google Doc idea and apply it then to patient records and stuff. So IT management, obviously all, all of this has to be managed. The chief technology officer or chief information office or officer manages the organization's information systems. The Council on Affordable Quality Healthcare is a nonprofit organization of alliances of health plans and trade associations that discuss the efficiency initiatives to exchange patient information. Uh, again, the data languages and all of that, everything being able to, to flow back and forth is uh, really important and it's not an easy uh, problem to solve. As part of their initiative, they have created a committee on operating rules for information exchange. So yeah, what are the languages? What, you know, what are the rules of how things are coded? Um, what, you know, and this borrows from the banking industry standards for one of the largest electronic payment systems in the world. So uh, again, they're trying to build an infrastructure where everything is going to be connected and information can flow back and forth easily. As part of the required data standards mandated by the Affordable Care Act, CORE is being used for data exchange of EHRs to ensure, again, the compliance with HIPAA and other standards and stuff. And one of the good things to hear, for example, with HIPAA, is that with these electronic health records and with stuff flowing back and forth is, is there is an electronic footprint of everything that happens to this record, who all accesses, what they look at, at what time, what do they do, what are they adding, what are they modifying and all that kind of stuff. And so that can be really important um, if, you, if you suspect maybe that somebody has accessed your health information that was not authorized, there's a way to audit that and see the, the trail of uh, access and in, in, uh, what happens in the electronic health record. So uh, other IT applications, enterprise, enterprise data warehouses or EDWs, um, they were developed to provide information that helps organization in strategic decision making. Data warehousing requires integration of many computerized systems across an organization. The IOM has indicated that the Veterans Affairs EDW is one of the best in the nation. It has a corporate data warehouse with four regional data warehouses. And CMS established an EDW in 2006 to improve the management of all their insurance claims. And stuff. And in a study on health information and, uh, implementation and management, um, the Swadonsky and Smith interviewed six hospital CIOs and nurse managers to assess why they use health information technology and why it's important. The CIOs indicated they use health information, health information technology to streamline administrative processes in the organization. All recognized a substantial cost invest but understood that the investments was long-term and that would ultimately be very cost efficient. The nurse managers focused on the ability to, to reduce medical errors. 
as a result of HIT and also indicated having electronic patient data ultimately contri contributed to more efficient and effective clinical decision making. Because you have, you have access to all the information that you need right there in the system and you can look it up and you can pull it up and you can make uh, decisions that are data driven because the data is there and you don't have to hunt for it. So uh, major IT issues in healthcare is a need to establish, again, this interoperability of these EHR systems nationwide, uh, establish these health information exchange and regional um, health inf information organizations are the foundation of this interoperability uh, within a geographical area. The communication between systems will enable the patients to be treated more quickly because there will be immediate access to their most current medical information. The full use of these EHRs nationally will also expand um, the success of telemedicine nationally. Overall, these will ultimately be cost saving and increase um, access to healthcare services. And that is the last slide. So if you have any questions, put them in here. And I uh, thank you for your attention.